Well, what would an English lad do on a gap year in Australia? Maybe be a pommy jackaroo? I'm a 19-year-old English boy on a gap year. He's doing things that he's never done before. Those sorts of things always stick with you. I might not even return back home. You guys have it good. <laughs> I would love to know the actual stats on how many young English, British people that go to Australia for a gap year and don't return home. I would love to know the actual figures. If anyone can find them, let me know. The big shock for me was kind of uh, him out of space and open road. It takes you six hours to get from Melbourne to Hay, whereas you could do six hours on a train and get to Edinburgh for London, which is ridiculous. Hey, I've already said that. And I, and I said that when we actually visit Aust visited Australia last year and we're coming again this year. But, it, you know, for example, this is, this is on the minor side of things. It took an hour an hour and a half to get from Melbourne to Geelong and Geelong is meant to still be Melbourne. And, and and it's little things like that. And that's, that's on the small scale of distance. The time it took, for example, to get to the blue mountains and it's, 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 um, it's bizarre to us where everything is fairly close. Uh, but I've, I've said all that before. It's one of the great things. It's almost like road tripping in a sense. I'm Charlie DePel. I'm a 19-year-old English boy <laughs> from London. So I'm from the southwest of London, a suburb of Putney. It sounds posh. I'm a city boy, so why not be here in, in the countryside of New South Wales, eh? We are in a small town called Hay. I'm currently working in Mungadal, which is a sheep rearing property. So it's 115,000 hectares, it's primarily merino wool Mental. operation and all native saltbush country. We've got frontage to the Murrumbidgee and Lachlan rivers. Yep. I'm currently on a, on a gap here. This is basically a year between studying from secondary school and uh, what, what you want to do in later life. So it's, it's a time where one allegedly finds himself. Great to have Charlie out here as part of the Mark Everson program and he's really embracing the opportunity. He spends a lot of the time I think awestruck at the sheer expanse and enormity of the landscape out here and the wide open spaces, the magnificent sunsets and the beautiful sunrises and he's being privy to all of that. I don't blame him for having this sort of reaction. If you watch our vlogs, go to Charlie and Rob um, on YouTube and you'll see my my reactions and Charlie's reactions, for example, when we went to the Blue Mountains, we were just, I say I was lost for words. Obviously, we're filming, so I had to think of words. But I was lost for words at just the enormity that the, just the sheer scale of everything. And, and I think coming from where we come from in the UK, don't get me wrong, the UK has some absolutely gorgeous, beautiful places. But Australia has those places and they're different. So, you know, I, you can't blame him for having, you know, that sort of reaction to, to being in Australia. You, you can literally, I found ourselves staring off the edge of a cliff down into the valley and into, onto the other side of the cliff in the Blue Mountains. And I could just stay there just looking and staring. And it was amazing. So... I appreciate why he has that feeling as well. To begin with, it's, it's the sun, the biggest one there. It's staring at me. We don't have that back home. <laughs> well, we see little of it anyway. The country tends to give you that more peripheral view of things going on around you as opposed to the traffic right in front of you and, and things like that. Just doing things that he's never done before, possibly never do again, but that, those sorts of things always stick with you. 
simple stuff like situational awareness and just being aware of what's around you rather than just what's right in front of your face. Yuck. You know, they're, they're <laughs> lifelong skills. So he's been able to go out into the paddock and do some mustering. He hasn't really done any sort of sheep handling or anything like that previously. There's a lot that's fun around mustering. You know, there's a lot of stressful around mustering as well. You've got to keep an eye at all times on where you're going. And at the beginning, it's quite hard locating all of them, all the sheep throughout the paddock. Be conscious of your surroundings. I hope that I'm going to be able to use that a lot more when I get home as well. You know, it'd be different, but I hope I can. I'm not used to kind of constantly trying to look at and spot things and 24/7 and kind of action. I'd say I've, I've gained a fair few new skills. Hopefully, you know, I can I can work pretty well with sheep. That's a good start, and I'm loving being outside all the time as well. We mustered uh, 4.7 thousand sheep. We basically mustered from fairly small small paddock uh, out into the yards here, as you can see behind me. These are a fair few. <laughs> And these are basically all the young, kind of year old sheep, which we're going to class and we're going to sort out. Just imagine being, an, I think he said he was a 19 year old, having that responsibility in helping mustering <laughs> thousands of sheep. Oh my God, that is an experience that, wow, imagine if when I was 19, what the hell was I doing when I was 19? It certainly wasn't anything like this. I was at college, I expect. No, I just finished college, becoming a pest controller. That wasn't very fun. Um, anyway, but this sort of experience at the age of 19, and he's so right about being outdoors. You know, I'm outdoors a lot of the time with, with, with some of my work. And it's, yes, it can be wet, cold, miserable. Um, but then when the sun is out and the weather is nice, it is so great to be out in the open rather than stuck in an office. And so to have that all the time, you know, you would think most of the time Australia's weather is a little bit nicer than, than England. So on the whole, it's probably nicer being outside in Australia. I am part of a, a foundation from the UK. It's set up after this chap with Mark Everson, who, who basically did all these amazingly great things. He really did show a lot of the, the characteristics of kind of one of the old English explorers almost, you know, the great ones. And that's really what this, this is designed to promote. It's designed to really push people out and about and be on their comfort zones. You know, we're all looking at our phones, but why not look at the world instead, right? And that's, that's really what's, what's brought me out here. Mark Everson was a young Englishman who came out to Mungadal as a jackaroo in, I think, 2001, 2002. And I knew Mark briefly, played footy with him when I was working on another property in the area. Just a really good, fun bloke, just go-getter, really friendly, enthusiastic, just willing to you know, have a crack at anything, really. Pom was his, his nickname, yeah. Pretty, pretty simple, but a good one, and he, he liked it, he was proud of it. I was born and bred in Hay and, and started jackarooing myself at, at Mungadale for the Twine and Pastoral Co. And yeah, lucky enough in my time there, Mark arrived, and uh, yeah, we grew together from there. In the short time, we were there together. A proper bundle of energy. So there was a job there to be done. It no sounds like it's going to have a sad ending. First one to hop in, get his hands dirty, and be a part of it. No complaining, no whinging, he yeah, just got the job done. He was very keen to stay. Unfortunately, he had to go home, he bought a call to join the army and, and follow the ending. footsteps of his father and grandfather. He was a military man as well, so um, very focused, very head straight, knew what he was doing. Quite a role model from what I've heard and from what I've seen. Seven Platoon's commander was Lieutenant Mark Everson, a rising star in the Welsh Guards. At the time, British forces were overstretched in one of the most dangerous areas of Helmand. He's a fit guy. 
007, they called him. To get a radio signal, Everson stepped into the doorway of Compound One. And that's when the burst of uh, about three to five rounds then came through that doorway. He actually just stood, took it as if he was fine, speaking on the radio, until he seen a bit of blood on his hand. He actually realised that he's been shot. His face just went pale. Mark Everson died on May the 12th, 2009, three days after he was wounded. I hope this journal will help to put things in perspective for those back home who want to read it. He's not someone easily forgotten. Very sad to see a young bloke of his character and attributes he had to, to see what happened, yeah. I think his dream was to get back here one day and meet the right one and fulfil his future in Australia, you know, on the land. Wow, that's um, what was what was a, a happy story about a pommy becoming a jackaroo, and it's just actually wow, that's um, not nice, is it? It's really not nice. I hope, hopefully, it's. It's going to be, as the title said, living the legacy of a J Pommy Jackaroo, the legacy that's, you know, not necessarily started uh, by this guy, but <sighs> this initiative was started by him. Oh, man, that's um, got me. That's really got me. I only wish I got to meet him, to be honest. It's a saddened story, so I'm just happy that, that we're out. Well, I'm out here and I'm doing what I can, really. Well, I crossed paths with the Mark Everson Foundation through some correspondence that came across my desk. We sort of talked and came up with the idea that we could run a program as part of the foundation to get someone out here and part of a Jackaroo exchange program. Just trying to keep that tradition alive of that, that generation or the younger person who really wants to get out of the comfort zone, get out of the family home and away from what they're used to and just... You know, it doesn't matter where it is in the world, just go out and try something different, challenge yourself and, you know, push new boundaries. It's just, just keeping that alive. It's really great to see young people embrace that adventurous side of things and I think it just, it's such a great lesson in life. Just getting involved in everything. He's become very involved in the local community. He's already, he's playing two codes of football. That's rugby. <laughs> Yeah, I joined the league team and the local union team and it's a really big part Both of really rugby. getting invested and getting into your community, you know, sports is, is great and I love the fact that Australia especially takes their sports so, so seriously. It's just, just good to be part of, good to see these you know, young people who are willing to really challenge themselves and just have a go at anything. They just need to, to, to see if they can actually do it without their phones for a bit or without kind of internet or communication. We put themselves in fairly uncomfortable environments. You know, we go from, you know, mid 40 degrees in summer to, you know, zero degrees, you know, in the winter. You know, we, we get out in the cold and the wet and whatnot. So, and they just embrace that and, you know, they do what we do and they just suck it up and, you know, learn from it. It's a good experience. Who says it might not even return back home? Mm -hmm. Apparently that happens a lot. <laughs> you guys have it good. <laughs> I think opening up the doors for, for young, young people is, is, is one of the big ways forward, right? It's the next generation, apparently. I'm not sure you want it to be in our hands, but... <laughs> <laughs> the longer distances seem smaller now. Moving around is, is just something you have to do, and you know, long journeys are nah, they're easy. What you should do is you should get out, you should get out and see everything. You know, there's a big world out there, and... I'd have to say, something like this, you know, where you've got this absolutely amazing sky, you're working kind of on, on the land, you know, moving around. You know, it's, it's really something, and it's something you're going to remember. And I'm hoping that I'm going to have some great memories of this place when, you know, the rest of my life, anyway. Oh, it's, that's brilliant. Uh, I, that took a real emotional dip during that. 
I think it's fantastic that you get young people that are willing to do something like this. And I think at the moment, yes, there's ups and downs in my life. You know, there are mostly good. Let's be honest. It's mostly good. There's always going to be difficulties, stresses and and, and downsides in, in anyone's life. But mine's mostly good. But I think if I knew about something like this, when I had just finished college, for example, I would have snapped at the chance. I really, I think I would have snapped at the chance. But that's not to say that what I've got now isn't fantastic. I've got an amazing wife. I've got businesses that that allow me to live a life where I can basically do what I want, live how I want, mostly. Um, but I think... I would have snapped at the chance to have done something like this if I knew about it after I finished college at that sort of 18, 19 year old age. And I may not have come back, but I would love to know the stats. As I said, I'd love to know the stats as to who came back, who hasn't come back and stayed in Australia. That would be really interesting to know how much of a draw was Australia to these people that went out there for, say, gap years. That would be really interesting to know. That was a fantastic video. Thank you so much for watching. Once again, you guys make my channel. Please do like and subscribe and I'll catch you next time.